Welcome to Ari Shavir's Skeptic Tank for the week of Monday, January 2nd, 2012. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, on today's episode, I interview my friend and colleague, Mr. Don Barris, about this crazy, crazy show he's been putting on for decades now called The Ding Dong Show. It is one of the most interesting and unique shows that you will ever see. It's just fucking nuts. I'm telling you right now... Uh, I try my best to explain to you guys what this is through this podcast, but I don't do it full justice. You get sort of an idea of it, but if you're ever in Los Angeles on a Monday night at 10 p.m., slide by the comedy store and check the show out. It's just something to be seen. It's, it's really, really amazing. Um, I, we'll explain it through this podcast, but it's just this crazy show, and you guys, one of my favorite things to watch, and hopefully I can share some of this experience with you guys. Um, Don was on my, uh, podcast, uh, I think episode 19 with Brody Stevens, um, talking about audience warm up that you can find on death squad TV on their iTunes account or on, that's when I was still doing the podcast with red band, uh, or on my website, there's a link to it. Um, Ari the And, uh, that's it. I'd like to give a shout out, quick shout out to my sponsors, Adam and Eve.com. Um, that's an adult website. They specialize in selling merchandise like lubricant or lingerie, um, dildos and such, flashlights, male vaginas, all sorts of all sorts of adult items for for sexual pleasure. So here's the deal: they're kind enough to sponsor this, so I can keep doing it. Um, why don't you go there and buy an item? And if you do, here's a special uh, a code they give you for some free stuff. If you if you as you're checking out, if you put in the code uh, the offer code Ari A R I at adamandeve.com, at checkout, you will get three free DVDs. That means porno DVDs. Um, a free extra gift, 50% off one item, and free shipping. Very good deal for you guys. I'm a Jew. I know good deals. So check that out now, adamandeve.com. Uh, in terms of stand-up, I got my storyteller show uh, tomorrow, if you're listening to this immediately, uh, January 3rd at the Improv in Los Angeles, improv.com. This is not happening presents report card. I'm just telling a bunch of stories. Not me. Me and my friends are telling stories about uh, about school. Tom Herrera, one of the greatest comedians of all time. Um, Kumail Nanjiani, Michael Costa, Stephen Brody Stevens from a couple podcasts ago. Who else is on that show? I forget. There's one other name. Oh, Mr. Burke Kreischer, The Machine. He's on there. So uh, please come down to that. It's $5. It's an experimental show. After I tape this one, I'll have enough uh, materials to start putting these out in a podcast, which means I'll probably do it in like three weeks. Uh, and I'll tell you guys, again, I'll tell you when that's this out. This song is in place of a copyrighted song. This song is in place of a copyrighted song. Well, no, it's, it's you could down, honestly say, yeah, it, it, you could really give it credit for starting in 1992. 1992. Yeah. So this is a show, you, I should say this, Don Barris, the comedian at the Comedy Store, um, and uh, he runs a show upstairs in the belly room every Monday called The Ding Dong Show. We'll get yes. into what it is later. But it started in 1992. Yes. And when you said a comedian at the comedy store, I'm not a comedian anywhere else? No, he's a comedian, and I know him from the comedy store. When I introduce other comedians, it's, it's a comedian at the comedy store or it's a comedian on the road. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'll buy yeah. that, but okay. <laughs> go ahead. I'm not, not going to try to attack you at all. Um, okay. Now, let me ask you this right off the yes. bat. Now, this will help me. This show will help me. Uh, I don't know. I, I can't. I don't. I don't know. I don't, can't. Do your promise. fans what like do you mean people? Help you? Well, because I've been told, okay, go on popular podcasts to push yeah. your shit. Yeah, sure. And I mean, it's a way for people to find out about you. Really? Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, it's like getting worried that going on Jimmy Fallon to promote your movie because you, what? I don't know. You just you, you go out there everywhere. Yeah. I'll do every podcast. I don't care. I mean, it's not like a KKK podcast or something where it's like. And even if it was, you we're not at that level where it would really affect us that badly. All right. If Tom Cruise went on the KKK podcast, it would hurt him. Yeah. If I did or you did, no one would even notice. Didn't it hurt you with the... Uh... Amazing Racist? Yeah. You mean the millions and millions of fans I got from that? <laughs> Followers? Really? Or are you talking about the 30 or so people that... that no, I thought it hurt you with me. commercials. One place won't call me in anymore. Really? Yeah. This guy pick up, but he, he more or less retired. Not fully, but he semi-retired. It, it was just one anyway. guy? and It was one cast. It was one production company that yeah. used one guy. He was well, a big guy, though. He well, did all the IBM spots and the 
And the um, that was the funniest thing. All these people were like, "I wonder if IBM knows that they're using this racist guy." But first of all, it's like it's irony. It's not. It's not me really being racist. It's just ironic. Yeah. But second of all, I'm like, um, IBM um, created a system of analysis for the Nazis so they could better exterminate Jews. <laughs> They, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a way for them to like, yeah. Is that true? Yeah. They they had these punch cards. You know those old punch cards? Yes. But yeah, they dev- designed one of those to show who was being shipped where and when. Yeah, that was IBM. Really? So I wouldn't really worry about me ruining their legacy. Okay. <laughs> I really wouldn't worry about it that much. But when these Midwestern housewives complain, somebody's like, Ugh, it's not worth it. Let's just, all right, we can't use that guy. Yeah, see, that's the thing. A lot of people just said, uh, that's not a problem, and then just went away. But some people said, oh, I, I can't use it. I really wonder about that type of racism. I really do. Like in the Midwest, because people are so freaking racist there. Yeah, that's the problem. I was once in Vegas with my friends, and some people misunderstand it. Some people don't go like, yeah, it's funny. It's ridiculous what you did. A Jew in a Klan outfit is ridiculous. Right. You know, they don't get that. That alone is comedic. But this guy, so some of them like, how dare you do that stuff? But this guy in Vegas was with my friends. He goes, hey, you're that amazing racist guy, huh? And I was like, yeah. He goes, I like what you did to those niggers. And I was like, oh, oh. Jesus. When, when I was I, like, no, that's the wrong way. When I was on the road with Dice, he would get letters from people, like when we go to a venue or something, yeah. and he would read them, and he goes, hey, I like what you do to that Jew stern, you know, fuck. Really? Oh, just. And he's like, yeah, I'm Jewish. Yeah, well. I'm not trying to get. They don't know that <laughs> I'm Jewish. <laughs> um, so you've been. Uh, yeah, so it's not going to be bad for you. No. I Well, no, I want it to be good. That's the whole thing. Oh, yeah, it'll be good. Because I also have a podcast, as you know. Yeah, podcast what's Network. What's the name of your podcast? The Simply Don, the Podcast Network. Exactly. Network. I don't know Sim- why I put it past tense. Yeah. Well, it isn't. But um, uh, So I'm trying to learn this whole thing. And, you know, you do a good job. I don't know how thanks. you do it. I don't know either. I just really? sort of be myself. But how do you get fans? Um, I, I just try to stay true to um, what, I, what I find comedically important or what i find artistically important really yeah i try not to be anything that i'm not like who have you had on that you didn't like i didn't like yeah um as a as a person you mean uh as a person as or a as, guest as an interview yeah. uh, let me try to think who the interviews i wasn't that into um there are people that i've had on that wouldn't open up and that was really annoying that i'm like the point is to try to the point of this is to try to discover some version of life that i'm not completely aware of right so you get some sort of expert on the subject or on a job or something like that uh, like I talked to Neil Brennan about directing movies. Right. I've never directed a movie. I don't. Re- I, I can guess what it's like, but it's like, let me ask someone who's done it. How many movies has he directed? One. Which one? The last one. The Goods. Right. Yeah. Um, but he understands the process of being able to- Just being on the movie Being able to shoot a movie, and then exactly. how do you get a star, and who, who casts it, and who's more important, and all that stuff. Right. And that was, so that must have been interesting. Yeah. I, I talked to a guy who's, who's super open, who just has sex with hookers. No more regular women. Um, Is that Mike Black? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I actually saw that. Oh, really? Yeah, he was just yeah. in the Spider-Man outfit. That's when I was still at Death Squad. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty great. But it was like, a lot of people go, oh, he's just sad, or he must hate women. And it's like, well, maybe, but what you're doing is just just giving up like an idea of something without really knowing anything about them. Right. So why don't we ask him? And, and if and he was he open, was, and he was. And he was, he was very open. Yeah, and I people were like... That. Oh, you just need to be more confident. He goes, yeah, I know. I've heard that like a thousand times, but it wasn't working. So now what's your answer? You can't just, it, everyone tries to like tell people the answers behind their backs. Right. And it doesn't really help. They, they probably have already heard what you said a bunch right. of times. And they, or they've thought about it. Yeah. And they're like, yes, but that won't work because I have one leg, so I can't run fast or whatever it is, you know, whatever right. the thing you say is like, no, you don't understand. Right. I had my friends talk about me the other day because I, I left this girl that I know, um, uh, we were recording a podcast somewhere else on like Rogan's network and I went into the ice house to do a spot and I texted her and I said, Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll be right back out. You want to watch this? You want to come in? And she goes, Oh, it's, this is fun. I'll just stay and watch this. I was like, okay, cool. And then I left and they were all talking about like, how could you just leave that girl there without even asking her? And it's like, yeah, you don't know. I didn't just leave her there without asking her. Right. If you would care to ask, you'll find more of the situation. Right. Well, that's, that's a good way to learn. Yeah. So I want to learn about this Ding Dong show that you've, that you've been doing since 1990 what? Four? 1992. Wow. That's the year I graduated high school. Yeah. Wow. I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. Well, I really think, it, I don't know how you want, you want me to just go into it. Yeah, you stories, and then I'll questions? ask questions to guide here or there. But like, it's, well, you see, the way it got started, If, if yeah. you, it, most people probably have no idea what the Ding Dong show is. So what it is is really, uh, or 
it's been called different things. Yeah. But my goal with it at the time, I just one day was sitting there and thinking, what am I going to do? I'm not getting spots anywhere. Yeah. I'm not doing anything. Yeah. I, I want to do something. And I just kind of analyzed what I had going and I added it up. And the only thing that I had going on a regular basis was I was emceeing the potluck shows. And I started realizing that there's a the lot potluck of shows, the open mics, the, comedy the open store. mic, right yeah. at the comedy store. And that was when I would go from seven to like two in the morning. Wow. Now they do seven to 10 and then 10 to like one. Right. And they also seven have seven to two in the morning, just straight through. You would host. And they had potluckers all night. And so it was three minute. Three, Three minute, minute comedy of people that are cr- are crazy. Some of them are. Some people are semi homeless. Right. And some people would also go on to become stars. Well, I yeah, absolutely. And I, and my viewpoint was, is that you'll see people that come to the potluck shows, like a Scotty Baron. Oh yeah. I mean, he's a pr- he's been doing comedy longer than I have. Wow. I did open mics with him. Yeah. I remember seeing him. I'm like, how does he get here? To sign up so much earlier than me. And he's, but he's so dedicated to yeah. it. Yeah. He has never, I mean, he's been doing it, because I've been here since ni- the fall of 1985. Yeah. And he was doing it before me. Yeah, that song. Put me on stage, you fucking piece of crap. Yeah. Put me on stage. Yeah, he was rapping he about just, some like club owner that doesn't exist anymore. Oh, well, he'd rip on me, I remember. I, <laughs> I, but, but the point was, is I was around these guys, and I found them more colorful than the guys bumbling through. It's like, interesting. Yeah, it was like, whoa, what makes them tick? I'll tell you this, when I hosted and it was hard, it was hard hosting when it was like a lot of bad comics because you're like, you got to get the audience going, but you also got to stay on time. You can't right. do 10 minutes in between everybody. Right. And so it would be like they'd bomb, bomb, bomb. And I thanked God for Boon Chakalaka once in a while right. coming out in his dress and a and a, a, a metal bucket on his head. Because they'd put some and kind of energy. Yeah, Absolutely. and everyone like got into it. I'm like, cool, at least I don't have to like, at least I can relax for three minutes once. So I knew... That this was something, and I was good at it. I would yeah. get the audience laughing at this. So I thought, let's find colorful, colorful comics yeah. or people that wanted to be comics. Now, how would it, you get them to laugh at it? Would you be like, was there like a specific technique or was everybody different? Would you like mock, make fun of the people? When I hosted, I, I made fun of almost everybody. See, my way of thinking in comedy isn't to make fun of people. Okay. I really don't like that. No, everybody's I, got different things. Yeah, I, I really, I, I think that I'd rather have people, see, I was taught a long time ago, if you can't be funny, be interesting. Mm-hmm. But I just think that being mean is something you don't yeah. need to do. And so I always thought, I'm never going to be mean. And I, I think I'm pretty good at that. I don't think I'm ever mean to anybody. Not really. I no. mean, you have... Uh, like, give me something that I do on stage that's mean. Um, you call me a worthless Jew a lot, and you think I should die, and the rest of my people should die. I and... said die. Mm, extermination. You're, you're, I think. you're exaggerating. <laughs> yes, I, I guess so. You're oh no, you, yeah, no, you don't do mean stuff. Actually, no, I, I don't. I'm joking. And even even with you, it's it's completely yeah. funny. And if it offended you, it doesn't offend me. Ever. I it's know ridiculous. It. I know it. It's and so that's... it's so far overboard that it's like anyone who thinks it's real is exactly. Ridiculous. Although we have convinced people before. Some lady came up to me once. You remember that? And she was like. Did you know that guy? He was so mean to you. And I was like, No, I don't. And I've been trying to get these people to step in and stop, them, but they won't do it. And well, he, I don't, she, he was, she went to compl- complain to Tommy. I don't think that you're even explaining uh, what, <laughs> what exactly? I do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you're going to talk about it, you should at least explain. You're like this next guy. I don't know if anyone's seen a Jew in captivity before, <laughs> but <laughs> Be- because it's just you are just so Jewy, but you're such a good guy. I mean, yeah. it just shows through, and you're. Your characterization that you portray as this guy, okay? No, you're mistaken. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. when you're like, yeah, when you're like, well, um, do you uh, mate with a devil on a general basis, or is that just once in a while? I'm like, well, oh, I think no. that we've opened it up during the Q and A, where people from the audience can ask questions, and, a, and it's a big hit with other comics. <laughs> yeah. So they're more the ones that go with that. They may ask where your tail is and things like that. Yeah. What do you generally do? How is it? What do you, what's the line you do? Uh, why'd like you your, kill our savior? Well, that's, that's, that's not, not that's like the spoken opening. line, but like, where's your line of like, how do you, you like, you kind of come from this place of like, I hate those people so much. No, I'm, you, I'll, I'll tolerate him around, but you, you know what? I think that you, when I'm talking to people, you go, like, excuse me, do you know you're talking to a Jew? <laughs> I just want you to be aware. Cause I, yeah. I look out for you. I think that, uh, I like to go. So I really look at my stand up or stand up comedy as a whole because I think it's such a dying art piece. I really do. Do stand you? Up? Yeah. Dying. Um who has come out that's done something so different? Well, it's not different anymore. D- it, different is not the same as dying. 
but I just don't think it's as popular as it once was. That's that might be true. We're not affecting social change at all, right? The way Pryor or like Lenny Bruce would do, where it's like, "Whoa, what's going on here?" It's like or, or Kinnison. The, the, well, that shit doesn't see, happen anymore. Yeah, that's what I mean. You you would see a Sam Kinnison. Like when I started out, like in the late '80s, yeah, you would see like at the comedy store, you'd see Roseanne, Kinnison, Dice, just making it. All these people. Not that they made these major changes, but they just did something so different at the time. Yeah, Dice was very different. Absolutely. And Roseanne, yeah, they're all very different. And it's you don't see that anymore. Yeah, that's true. I wouldn't say that means it's dying. I heard, uh, what's his name from the Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Corgan, say this once. He said, um, there's nothing new in rock and roll. It's all been done. Right. Well, and that's but true. that doesn't mean rock and roll is dying. It just means it's going to be stagnant for a while, or it's going to just be new music, but not, like, now all it is is new bits, but not like, what is that that you're doing? Right. There's very little of that. Like, I think when a guy like Kinnison came out, it was like, whoa, where yeah. does this come from? Kaufman. A, Kaufman, but, like, at the time of Kinnison, there was, like, it was Kinnison, then Bobcat Goldthwait, and, uh, yeah. you know? It, it's just like, like, they were so different than that normal guy you would see on The Tonight Show. It was yeah. just crazy. Do you ever see Kinnison's Young Comedian special? Yes. It's right. amazing, because you got, like, Bob Nelson, right. Saget, I think... One girl, I forget who it was, and it's all fine. It's good. It's comedy. It's fine. It's some of it's funny, you know. Right. Some of it's dated, but it's funny. And then, uh, and then Kinnison comes in, and he just does a whole different thing. Right. It's so real, and he's full of real rage. Right. And it's like, oh, everything's about to change now. Comics can really talk about themselves now. Yeah, I think Pryor did a lot of that, but yeah. Pryor didn't do it with that kind of aggression. No, not like that. Yeah, but but those type of people. Anyway, so uh, so you saw these people that um, that you thought different very different and the club was packed i mean you look at like the comedy store now i mean literally on the weekends yeah on friday and saturday they'd have three shows in the main room three all shows packed, all packed like eight ten and twelve or something yeah wow and then they'd have two in the original room, all packed there was nothing but lines outside just to get in to watch this crazy right. art form and the place was packed the place was packed yeah, celebrities there like, and they just started the belly room for female comics to give them a place. Uh, or was that I was that was before okay. I got there, but at the time that was where like non paids went, and I remember it was a time that I would go and I'd steal everybody from the front. Hey, come on, try this show. Really? You know, yeah. If you don't like it, you know. Yeah. But anyway, we were talking about the Ding Dong yeah. show. I don't okay, know. so you would host. You would host this. I'll try to keep on track because I know you've you've you, you, you've imbibed, so it's fine. No, no, no. So, it, and I just saw. Hey, you know, there must be something to that. So I thought, I tried getting people convinced. What we should do is we should put a, a we should put a show together with all these colorful comics. Yeah. Some of them crazy, some of them just colorful. I know the crazy is not the best word to use. No, it isn't like, because they're not crazy, crazy. But that's what, you know what I mean when right, I say well, crazy. Because it's every, so different. Everybody puts them in a category. Some of them are. Some yeah. of them are literally out of their minds. But I just thought that, wow, this is something that would work good. And for me, it did because, like, at first, even Mitzi, the owner of the comedy store at the time, she didn't get what was going on. Uh, what do you mean know, she didn't get what was going on? Well, like... With your stuff or with... The- with with my stuff. Okay. Like, I one time had... I s- literally sold out the main room. I had 400 people. Wow. And she was like, oh, I don't want people like that in the main room. Uh-huh. And like, <laughs> She's what? so hard to deal with. The day of the show. So she gave me the original room. And, like, there was, like, you know, 250 people that got in there and everyone else in front. I mean, the place was a wow. seat. Yeah. It, because I've only seen it, like, that a few times where it's, like, we can't let you in. Yeah. It's, it's, we don't have any seats. And, I mean, there were 100 people just that waiting get for in. someone to leave. Yeah. So they get in. It was just crazy. I mean, they had buses come for that. She and, left for me when we had, we had a sketch show, a bunch of us um, together, me, Freddie Lockhart, and uh, I think Rena ZC and Simone, a bunch of people. And we we're all ready to do it in the belly room. We're so excited. And we get there and like, oh, Mitzi doesn't want you guys to do it. Yeah. We're like, well, people are here for us. We've been playing this for months. Uh, so, oh, so, much so what she did is yeah. she is she took that away and like the original Ding Dong show, you know, and then I just started doing a, taking that idea and putting it on public access, but trimming it way back. Public access television? Yeah. Yeah. And that became Perry. And which became the movie pretty. Windy City Heat and all that. Yeah, if you haven't seen the Windy City Heat, it's 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 pretty awesome. Oh, <laughs> it's just thanks. it's you had you had been. I'm gonna say fucking. Correct me if I'm using bad words, but fucking with this guy for about 
10 to 15 years, 13 years. Well, he was part of, in 1992, yeah. that's when I met him, and I brought him. Oh, right away. Yeah, he was in the original Ding Dong show. Okay. And what, you know, and if you haven't seen it, it's basically, it's the real life Truman show. Yeah, you convince this guy that we're going to make a, we're going to make a movie, and you're going to be the star. More or less, or I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to ruin well, anything. Well, right. Right, Okay. And it's early in the in the film, the, whatever. But yeah. yeah, but you you told him you're gonna make, you're gonna build him into a star. You've been telling him that for ten ten years. Yeah, and I did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> That's the amazing. That's thing. It. but the the point <laughs> he is, he was the star of a movie. That my feeling was at the time that we, it doesn't have to be everybody doesn't have to be funny and talented. Yeah, you can take somebody and you can make it work. Yeah, and that make, was my theory about the Ding Dong Show. I guess that you can make it funny despite the fact that they're not funny. Right. If you find what's funny about the people, oh, yeah. and that's what I did. And just I took, focus their energy the right exactly. way. Exactly. Ex- take what's funny about them and show it in a way. Now, with the Perry guy from the movie Windy City Heat, he's upset all the time. Yeah. So if you push that button. He screams in rage and that's when over he's nothing. And that's when he's funny. And that is funny. But like on stage, just doing regular comedy, it's pretty horrible. Yeah. <laughs> just left to his own devices. It's like, exactly. what is this? Exactly. Wow. So you you take the one thing out of people that makes them funny, right? Okay. And that and that's what kind of the ding dong show is. And yeah. there's people there, different people for different reasons. But I think that the whole thing works. And I've gone through a history because it's a show that's over twenty years old. It's just gone on and on and on. Yeah. Well, it's be, wait a minute. Is it nineteen? It's nineteen. Nineteen years. It's become, Are you gonna have a twentieth anniversary ding dong show? Yeah. Well. There's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, because the thing is, I worked with Perry and Mole since then. Yeah. So those guys, we're going to have a 20th anniversary of that, so I'm sure. Wow. Uh, at least on the podcast. Anyway. Okay. Oh, yeah, you definitely should do that. I don't... Is this making sense at all? Because yeah, Because it's like so. so much information that... It's people, a lot of information. Right. But they'll get it. So, okay, so here's what it seems like to the layman. It seems like, and it's fine, but you seem like you take someone who's like Perry, who's a little nut, nutsy. Oh. You know, a little crazy. And then, um, and you focus them, but it's sort of like they don't know they're being made fun of. I don't think, but and I don't think making fun of them. Yeah, it's not. I don't consider it be making fun. of. That's a cheap, easy but just, way but it's to like say you, when, it. With Perry, you laugh at his at him going into a rage. Right, you're laughing at this thing, but it's not like doing it. He's not doing it on purpose for a laugh. So we're making we're laughing at him, but he uh, doesn't know you're making fun of him. He doesn't know you're getting the laugh at his at his expense. But you see, the thing is, that's yeah. part of it. People do understand. It's like Brian Cosme, who was an, okay. a fixture. I mean, he got to the point where, uh, you know, Jimmy Kimmel fell in love with him, and he was on his show 13 times. He was a really innocent guy. He still is. Right. He's super innocent, like pure-hearted person, but he's so just... His IQ level would be that's ironically low. <laughs> right. All right. Well, he was brought up... Total white trash family. Yeah. Father, mother drank themselves almost to death, and that's what he grew up around. Yeah. But he's a kind-hearted person that just wants to succeed. He loves doing it. But Jimmy saw that kind-heartedness in him yeah. and has put him on his show 13, 13 times. 13 times. on Kimmel. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I saw him sitting next, behind, uh, what's his name, that one time? Yeah, he was actually, uh, Don Rickles was on the show, <laughs> yeah. and I was taking... He had moved back to Bakersfield, this Brian Cosme we're talking about. He had moved back to Bakersfield, and I was taking him to the bus stop, and we stopped by Jimmy Kimmel for a second. Yeah. And Jimmy saw him and like, hey, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> and he, So what he did is they had a thing where they were asking questions in the audience and for Don Rickles. Yeah. And one was a question from Brian, but he was sitting right next to Bob Newhart, and the joke was, <laughs> how long would it take... For, Rickles, for to Rickles to notice Bob Newhart <laughs> in the middle of this question that was going in all different directions. It was very funny. and But the, the fact is, he worked with Don Rickles <laughs> yeah. and Bob, Bob Newhart. Newhart. <laughs> I would love to have a sketch like that. Yeah. That I could show people. Oh, absolutely. So, And he, you have a lot of people that get by just on the government money. Yeah, that's... Okay. Yeah. I'm okay. trying to explain to people what type of people these are. Okay, like but a sort of a I don't want to put anybody in a crazy position because yeah. I don't think that they're there's there's you could go through life and find insanity in, in yeah. just about anybody. Yeah. Well, then how would you describe them? Because something separates these people. Colorful. 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 But you can find color in a lot of people too. Right. 
But what I do is I find color. If I see somebody, and yeah. I think they're colorful. Like you mentioned the guy Boone Shakalaka who is, how would you describe Boone if you were going to describe him? He's a uh, transsexual homeless uh, salesman He, he uh, that hangs out at the comedy store and has crushes on different comedians. Well, I think that his main way of business is, I don't know where he gets it, he but he steals, steals find stuff. all this stuff and, and he comes by with bags of all this stuff and he starts selling it. Everything's a dollar. Everything's a dollar. Sometimes two, if it's super high priced. Yeah, up. like if it's a computer. <laughs> yeah, it's two. <laughs> yeah, and every time he comes by, it's because it's pretty much it seems like a homeless guy. He's like, "Hey, can, can I interest you in these flowers?" And you're right. like, "No," but then you realize what he's selling, and he's like, "You want this awesome, beautiful, ornate box for a dollar?" And you're like, "No, bo- wait, how much? <laughs> a dollar? <laughs> right. a dollar? You, I'm willing to take that chance. Turn it down, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even if you don't want it at all. Just throw it in the garbage. Right. Well, sometimes I'll buy something. And oh, oh, do you want this book? I'll buy that book and I'll just rip it up in front, in front of him. Of after, him right <laughs> after I paid the dollar, he asked me once. He goes, "Do you like books?" And I was like, "Um, yeah, sure." And I was just fucking with him. He's like, "What do you like?" I'm like, "There's no way you're gonna know." I'm like, "I like Fitzgerald a lot. I like F. Scott Fitzgerald, but not The Great Gatsby. I've read that already." And he goes, "Oh, oh okay." <laughs> and he found me some stuff oh, from Fitzgerald that oh, wasn't but, Great Gatsby. Right. And I was like, "Yeah, I guess I'll buy it." <laughs> I've never read it, but I was like, "Sure." If you went and took orders, sometimes you can. See in my crazy world, yeah, I'll buy an abundance of stuff just to have the library. So buying oh. a book is not bad. Yeah, you're a bit of a hoarder. But so now you get a guy like Boone. He was in the Ding Dong he, Show for a little he while. He had been in the Ding Dong Show, but now you couldn't control him. How? Why would a guy I like that leave? I couldn't control him because I couldn't control him. So what you're looking for is someone you can control. It's not really can control, but fit into the program. Okay. And he wanted to be a lone wolf. Like I ask a couple things. Show up to the show on time. Okay. And just stay there. And you have a show every Monday at 10 o'clock? Every Monday, and it's been going on since 1992. At 10 o'clock in the belly room at the comedy o'clock. store? Well, it used to be earlier till another show. Just <laughs> yeah. back. <laughs> oh, was it earlier? What time was it before? Nine? It, well, I would, Whatever. yeah. Whatever. Nine? Okay, there was a show in there before. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because, so, but it's 10 o'clock. Right, which is hard because, like, a lot of people aren't going to on shows. On a Monday, yeah. On a Monday night. So you're going to sleep. And I, usually it doesn't start till 1030. Right. But what I'm trying to do, I'm about to put out a podcast with it. So, oh, nice. Yeah. So, what and what I'm going to do with the podcast will because it's like almost like a reality show anyway. Because we just find out what's been going on with these people and things like that. Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll I'll record the shows at the comedy store. We'll find some clips of things that went some pretty crazy. Moments. Play them in the show and have the cast around in the studio. Like you had that, you had that clip of. Um, that I remember loving of Brian Cosme watching uh, Blue Iris, who's a former member of the Ding Long Show. She passed away, right? And she actually, uh, if you are not familiar with Blue Iris, she uh, eventually became like kind of a a regular on the Howard Stern show radio yeah. show. She was an adult, like a super adult porn star, right? Like granny porn, but she was like, in some ways, her soul was really good because what she would do is she. Like just oh, got she was to the super point, nice. She got to the well. Oh, she's hey, also super bitchy. Your girlfriend looks really beautiful, right? But that was all a manipulative thing. She was very funny because she had had uh, electric shock therapy yeah. like thirteen times. But in back her when life. they didn't really know what they were doing, right? They're like, "Oh, shock her, see if that works." Right, and and it really affected her. Yeah, and she was but, fried. Right, but she learned with her handicap how to get things from people. And make wow. them feel she was very, very manipulative. The first time I saw her, she parked. You had to sign up for the open mic. You had to sign up at the comedy store, um, and uh, there was a list that was up. And they have forty names, and they pick out twenty random of those names. So you just sit there and kind of wait for them to pick out the names. It's a little different now. They do it right away. But um, she parked in front of the hotel next to the comedy store, and she goes, "Am I allowed to park there?" And she was parked completely in the red, with um, the f- back half of her car halfway into the first lane and i was like i can't even start to begin how you cannot park like that yeah um but she she eventually passed away but she um wait what was i gonna say about her i don't know i don't know she, she was jewish oh yeah she was jewish yes yeah, she was yeah she has bright blue hair oh i know what this clip she was eating a donut right and cosme saw her eat the donut and was so disgusted by it that he's he needed to throw up right <laughs> just and he just was throwing up but in the video he doesn't throw up by bending over. No. He just stands up straight and it and just, just lets it go out. down. Yeah. yeah. That became part of a joke for me. Really? <laughs> yeah. Because I saw another homeless guy do something similar. Uh, a homeless guy do something similar. Just cut a barf. And I was like, who just who doesn't know how to lean over? Oh. 
Who doesn't know how to lean over before you barf? Everyone knows that. You even watch dogs yeah. when, they, when they're throwing up. Yeah, they, they move. They yeah. convulse their bodies to get it away from them. Right. <laughs> but not cosmic. <laughs> so, um, so okay, you know what's a good term for them? Ding dong. That's a good You know term. who gave that name? Mitzi, the Mitzi. owner? Yeah. yeah. What was it? was Before it was called the Simply Don Simply Show? Simply Don. Yeah. Simply Don Show. Yeah. So you take these people, find the funny in them. Find the funny in them and just create a show. And it's But it's more of a reality show. Because yeah. like, if you look at it, I did this in 1992 before yeah. any reality television was yeah. out. I really did. And, you yeah, know, no, that's it took barely real world. Or... And, but the thing is, it was always reality. Whereas, you know, like the Osbournes, yeah. all scripted. All scripted. I hate it. You can see this. I saw uh, Love and Hip Hop. Do you ever watch that show? No. It's Jim Jones or Mike Jones. I forget the guy's name. Right. Mike Jones. Okay. And he's married to this chick or dating this chick. First of all, he's high. The, every time he's on, his eyes are almost nearly completely shut. And he's just like, all these crazy women around him. He's like, oh, whatever, man. <laughs> he just gets stoned and can deal with it. But it's like you see these two women talking in a restaurant. And you're like, I can just see through it. I'm like, this is, they're set oh. up. They're like, sit down and I'll start talking. And you know where the cameras are? Who are these other people that aren't turning around right. when they're screaming at a restaurant? I, have Those you ever, are extras. Have you ever been to a restaurant when they're filming something like that? No, what do they do? They tell uh, everybody. It's just they have everything roped off. Oh, yeah. Like, you can't get through here. Right. Westwood Bruco, they had a thing once where it was like eliminate or something. And I remember this guy, they wouldn't let you go up there, but we could watch him like down, but if we were behind, way behind the cameras. And this guy goes, I choose you, Mary Beth, because you give me this and this. And then they go, great, great, great. Hey, let's do it again. Try the other way. Uh, choose her this time. Right. And we'll see which one we want to use. I'm like, what? Exactly. Oh. It's just, it's so much shit. But this was reality before yeah. reality. And the movie, I mean, you know. Uh, when did Sid Heat was really an amazing movie? And it was all real. Like, Everything I feel was bad. It got kind of buried. Take. It aired like not that many times on Comedy Central, but it, it's is it available now? Can you it, get it? it? Absolutely, you can get on it. Amazon, Amazon, and all that. But the crazy thing about that movie is that it's almost good that it was buried by Comedy Central. So it stays underground. So it stays underground. But what happened is this: what was really nice is Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah. At the time, he loved it, and he pushed it to everybody that came oh, on yeah. his show. So you'd. It, here's uh who's a fan of that show of, of that oh uh, just there's so many people johnny knoxville johnny knoxville they wanted to do a sequel and for two and a half years we oh, were going to yeah. do a sequel with spike jones and things but perry got too too uh yeah just you know unmanageable yeah because he was suing everybody yeah. because what happens is this in the world of reality there's going to be some ambulance chasing lawyer that'll see loopholes because he's dealing with money i remember going in and, but, and then the production company's like, well, if there's a lawsuit, I'm not dealing with it. Right, I'm exactly. Too much risk. Oh, I remember going into a uh, uh, a Jack in the Box, and they had one of those TV screens. Yeah. And the thing under, uh, Perry Caravello sues Johnny Knoxville's uh, Jimmy Kimmel, Adam Carolla, and like, whoa, it's making the news. And when he sues, it's not like, hey, you caused me physical and, and mental damage. When he sues, it's like, hey, what can I sue for? Exactly. So I'm just going to try to sue. It's just an ambulance chasing lawyer. I got sued for $800 million once. Really? From from one person like that. We convinced this guy. Um, he was he was uh, fucking with Rogan, was 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 taping him, and uh, he thought he was the second coming of Christ, and he was the Holy Spirit. Right. And so he was recording him and talking to him, and then the guy got um, cold feet about it. And he goes, you know what? I don't want you using that. I want you to erase it. And, lawyer, and Rogan's like, yeah, you got to call my lawyer. Um. I was at home. I didn't know any of this. I just got a call from Rogan saying, Ari, listen, you're my lawyer. Somebody's going to call you. Okay, you're my lawyer. I'm like, what? What are you lawyer? Who am I talking about? I'm like, hey, somebody's calling you the line. He goes, you're my lawyer. Goodbye. And <laughs> this guy called. So I managed to finagle it to where I represented this guy as well as Rogan. Um, uh, and I made him give me power of attorney over all his affairs. I'm like, I need you to say the words as I recorded him. It was really fun. And it went on for like six months to a year. And then I got tired of it. And I sort of like, hey, I'm, I can't work pro bono for you anymore. And he sued me for $800 million. Really? Yeah. And you know what? Here's the crazy thing. Yeah. Anybody could sue you for anything, and no matter how yeah. ridiculous. And, and it's if, my legal responsibility to exactly, reply to that. Exactly. You have to go to court. I can't just be like, this is stupid. I'm ignoring it. Like when that girl at the comedy store. Yeah. Uh, do I need to? I probably shouldn't mention her name because I don't want to give her credit. Okay, don't. But she tried suing me. Yeah. Now, what I had done is I had asked her to be part of my show because she would scream at me. Now, that was, she has, I thought she was the unfunniest comic <laughs> yeah, ever. But you get her so riled up. Because she just, she had so much hate in her. Hate and, so much. And you would say like one thing from the back. And she's like, ah, 
on. Right, but it wasn't just me. I remember yeah. her getting a fight with Dice. Oh, I remember yeah. the, the classic line, you're, you're a has-been, Andrew, you're a has-been. She goes, at least I wasn't a never was. <laughs> yeah. And it was... <laughs> I remember the first time Rock or Eddie Murphy, I forget which one, they look similar in my mind for some reason. But uh, I think it might have been Eddie Murphy, but he was finally, like, he was always quiet and by himself when he's there. Right. They both are. But, like, um, one time he was talking. He was talking to Dice or something like that or somebody. Uh, he was opening up. It was nice to see him, like, hanging out, like, with the guys. Nobody right. Comics don't care. They're not going to bother you. But she came up. She's like, oh, hey, how are you? Right. Can I talk to you about stuff? And he was like, oh, back to my shell. I got to leave now. Exactly. I'm like, fuck but, you. Come on. But what she saw, but what she actually saw, so she, but what she did, yeah. she came up and she said, she was suing me for sexual harassment. Yeah. Now, this is something that never happened. Then in court, she claimed that I hit her. Now, I had I had video oh, of the night she claims that you hit uh, her. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was ridiculous. That helps. Uh, but, but you have to supply that. I had to go. Right. You have to supply that. I, had, Otherwise, I like, well, had to go up there, and it cost tens of thousands yeah, of dollars. Yeah, it's weird. It's not innocent until proven guilty. It's not. Right. It's like, you have to pay for it's lawyers. It's like we'll see, and you got to pay for it. Yeah. Right, but what we she originally took me to small claims court, and just to show you how nut she was, yeah, it's in small claims court. They say to you, and which was kind of fun. I mean, you know, I actually had. Uh, oh, you made a you made a joke out of it. Yeah, yeah. I had Duncan, who had one time been the uh-huh. talent coordinator. That's what he was there for, and I brought people that were witnesses. Yeah, and it was great because her only witness was Perry. So in a way, <laughs> it was just like I would have loved to have filmed it. Yeah, and I was really thinking, this is perfect. If you want to take me, why don't you take me to the people's court? I'll do that in a second. Nobody oh, yeah. loses. It's on. Everybody camera. makes a little bit of cash. Absolutely. They do when you get some more, but. Fine. So now in small claims court, they say to you, all right, before the judge hears your case, do you want to go out and try to talk about it? So she comes out and she's smiling at me, you know, and she had actually always said, if you were such an asshole, I'd like to fuck you. I mean, this is like things that she had said, honestly said to me. Which, by the way, I've heard similar things like that from girls. That means she wants to fuck you. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, the, the point is, so she... We go out and we start talking. She goes, okay, first of all, you know you're wrong. And I said, I really don't think I'm wrong. <laughs> she goes, oh, here, here's what I want, okay? I want you to talk to Mitzi, the owner of the comedy store. I want you to get her back, get me back into the club. I want you to talk. I want you to give me some money for the hospital bills. And I want you to talk to Jimmy about being on the show. And I said, well, I will never give you a dime. I will, Jimmy will never know your name. And if you want to be part of the comedy store... I'll talk to Mitzi about you being part of the Ding Dong show again. Yeah. She didn't, you know, none of that. That's work. not what she wanted. No. But she She wanted but to get like primetime she spots. Wanted, on stage. She wanted to get on stage. She wanted to get on Jimmy Kimmel. It's like, right. Oh, and she's, you money grabbing. That's, like, that's the way she's doing it. What a what an evil, evil person. But in what, her mind, she's like, well, I got. Here's, she, my, here's my theory. You know how people that are like losers, no one talks to them? Right. Those people don't notice when you're busy and you clearly don't want to talk to them because that's how everyone looks at them. So from someone like her point of view, it's like this is the way you get stage time. Absolutely, you got to sue somebody, and you, or just being. A, but she would go around and tell girls, "This is a woman thing. We are fighting for a cause." <laughs> and I'm like, "What are you talking about?" She wanted to be part of my show. I said, "This is what's going to happen in the Ding Dong show. This is what I need you for because we argue well together." And she didn't want to do it. She, no, she did want to do it, oh. but then she just changed her mind. Yeah, that's the problem with dealing with those people. They're right. not the most stable of people in the and world. And she went out, and she got a lawyer. It co- and not only did she get that lawyer, but that lawyer then convinced Perry, Perry. Oh. to to be a witness for her. And if he did that, this lawyer would represent him in a case against everybody else. Wow. It just she's an evil person and the fact the comedy store would ever let her back in there just kills me every time yeah if, if you ever if you end up watching this movie when he's at a heat which it was hilarious it was absolutely hilarious but if you end up watching it just some people go like oh i feel bad for him it's like just know that he actually got his movie made and he made a grip of money oh beyond that he's the worst person in the world <laughs> yeah. too That's, I, mean, I remember at the premiere these people from comedy central my friend monica who works at comedy Central, she was like i feel bad for him and i was like yeah, but you shouldn't because he's kind of a dick. Like, he's one of the worst people I've ever met. And she goes, yeah, he did grab my ass out of the blue for right. no reason. I'm like, yeah, why would you feel bad for that? Right. He actually, uh, <laughs> I don't know why we're talking about him, but he actually, I remember one time, he used to go 
to the high school and yeah. eat lunch to look at women. <laughs> oh, creepy. <laughs> it's just creepy. like, exactly. At a high school? At a high school. He oh, would sit what there. What is he, like 45? Yeah, he was in his 40s. Oh. And, you know, but no matter what, just that fact. And he didn't get it when they asked him to leave. Why would they do that to me? I'm just sitting here with that boner. Yeah, and, oh, he was, and, uh, you know, he was a huge fan of Sam Kinison. And he was telling Sam, he had Sam's brother, Oh, boy, why can't I think of his name? But Bill? he had his, Bill Kinison yeah. on his show, his podcast. He had a, Scary not a podcast, podcast, excuse me, not a podcast, a public access show. Okay. Because at one point. Yeah, that was the way before, like you were in the public access world. Right. Instead of podcast world, I did the there public. There was none. Right. And I just did a podcast like once every month. And so his way of proving to me that he didn't need me was to go on and do his own podcast or his own public, his own access, public show. access show. Excuse me. That's how Tom Green got started with public access. Yeah. And Tom Green was great. Yeah. He was great he with that. From there. But he actually was talking about trying to marry Bill Kinison's daughter, who was like 15 at the time. Oh, I mean, really? it was like. He didn't get He's what he was saying. Creep. That's what I'm saying. And he was like, ah, ha, ha. and b- I remember Bill Kenneth, you say that again, I'm going to punch you. Really? Oh, it was. It yeah, was his daughter. Yeah. She's not of age. And it and was just, he just person. doesn't get it. So that's where he comes from. And I think that's, you see that he's such a jerk. And you and, take that and you're like, you know what? I can focus this and we can right. have people get laughs. Absolutely. And that's what it became. In spite of you. Exactly. And that's what it became, and that's what the Ding Dong Show really is, is yeah. that there's... But, uh, like, it's reality, but you also give them things to do, or they come up with, like, um, acts and stuff. Right. Like, that, they, they're, it's not just real. like, they have to know that, they have to think that they're going to become a star, that, like, it's some sort of, is it delusion? What is it? I, it's not a delusion, though. See, that's, okay. that's the thing that I look at. There are people that have pointed in the right direction. Uh, I'm trying to think of the guy that used to be on Letterman all the time. When Letterman first started out for the... Sarah Jilamujibar? No, he had three names, and it wasn't the... Oh, uh, uh, yeah, that old white guy? Yeah. Yeah, I forget his name. But he was a colorful guy. That was He wasn't crazy. He wasn't anything. But Letterman knew how to make him funny. Yeah. And I think that's what the Ding Dong Show is, kind of people like that. Oh, yeah. We're just like Sierra Jill and Mojibar. Like they just they just sell gifts downstairs, right? But he's like they have this Indian accent. Let's just put them in stuff, and we'll find something people can laugh at, right? There's something funny because they're funny characters that nobody else sees. I was at a, a, a Clippers game with Sebastian once, and it was so boring. <laughs> it was he just got free tickets or something, twenty dollars tickets. It was Portland Trailblazers for the Clippers. It was like seven eight years ago, and it was maybe like a, a two point game at halftime, but it was still boring. Nobody cared. And then we put 20 bucks on it. And he's like, who do you want? I'm like, I don't give a shit. Let's just bet. And then it became super exciting for us. It went to overtime. But they were showing all these people like on the, you know, dancing and stuff, you know, on the dance cam when it goes to the right. fans. And they showed a couple people. They showed this, this Asian guy. He's probably like 45 years old. Looked like Peter Chen sort of last we saw him. And, um, and uh, the whole place just started laughing at this guy dancing horribly right. with this Asian face. And they showed a couple other people. Then they panned back to that same Asian guy. And everyone laughed again. And then later in like the third quarter, they showed him again. And it was right. like, th- yeah, like that sort of thing. They found well, what makes this guy funny. Who was the guy on American Idol? Oh, yeah. The the Asian guy. David what? Taylor did a commercial with him. Hong. William Hong. William Hong, yeah. It, you see, is he crazy? Crazy? No. no. No, he's an engineer. Right. He's really smart. Absolutely. But he had no voice. Right. But he, he, had, he didn't have the talents he thought that he had. Yeah. And they just and he was in the perfect position. Well, if you can take someone like that and put them in the position, so, so it's not about being crazy. It's okay. colorful, colorful characters, and that's what the Ding Dong Show is. By the way, like like you said, and I just want to plug it just a little bit. Every Monday, it's the longest running show in the history of the Comedy Store. It's the Ding Dong Show, ten o'clock every Monday night. Also, uh, you know we're gonna be we're gonna have a podcast, uh, the Ding Dong Show dot com. But check out. Simply down the podcast network and look at some of the other shows. Yeah, you got I've a lot got of shows on here. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying to do it. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to get the. Uh, I'm trying to learn how to do everything on my own, so I don't need other people. That's the secret. Where uh, it's it, like, then you can find your own comedic voice, and no right. one's no one's stopping you. Nobody from getting your can, comedic voice. Right, and then, and I'm still not 100 percent computer savvy on how to do yeah. all that stuff. But once I learn that, man, it's just like 
I've got it. I can do whatever the fuck I want. Yeah. And now it's about promotion. That's the next thing. So come to that. Follow me on Twitter, Simply Don One. Simply Don One. Simply Don One. Just okay. the number one. You'll get a bunch of followers out of those. Willie? Yeah. I, I, sure. I didn't say Willie. I meant really Will is I? what I meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Will, yeah. Uh, but uh, also Facebook, Don Barris. Be, be my friend. I want to beat Brody. You want to beat Brody? Yeah. In terms of what? Friends on Facebook? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, no, let me ask you this. Yeah. You see, I've always thought that Brody was colorful. Yeah, he is. And he's fa- figured out a way to focus his stuff to get laughs. Yeah. Yeah. I've had Brody on this podcast. You see, Brody's... Brody's great, but oh, I thought you th- both on before actually. Yeah, oh, that was a crazy one. <laughs> you but, but you know what? But I yeah. see this Zach Galifianakis. Yeah. I see the way he Z- cracks up at Brody. Exactly because he sees what's, what's really funny about, funny about Brody. There was this clip of Zach coming out for Saturday Night Live when he hosted Saturday Night Live for the first time. Right, and my friend Marsha was there because she she does his website, and so uh, and then Brody was there because you know he's friends <laughs> with him. And so he comes out and he's all excited. And he, go, he gives Marsha a hug, Zach, and then he says something, he shakes someone else's hand. He's all excited. He's going out to host Saturday Night Live for the first time. And then he sees Brody. He's like, Brody, come on. <laughs> and he just keeps going. Just like, Brody's like, what, what? I didn't do anything. It's just funny. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. One time, uh, Zach was on Jimmy Kimmel Live. I also, for people that don't know or probably nobody cares, but I've also been the audience warmer for Jimmy Kimmel Live. Yeah. So what's that? It's fun to watch. Yeah, it's it's a fun gig. I'll yeah. tell you, I basically work ninety minutes a day, four days <laughs> yeah. a week. Yeah, it's <laughs> so I can put and try to do all this other stuff and kind of create. So that's what I love. Thank God for Jimmy Kimmel, boy. Yeah. I mean, to and he to, helped to make that movie too. Oh yeah, he was the producer of uh, Windy City. Nope, it's so funny because everybody, eh, what are you doing? Nobody cares. Yeah, but Kimmel saw it. And thought, whoa, this it is. It just takes some sight, some insight. Absolutely. But foresight I, or whatever. But it is. I look at that in show business. I look at like agents and mm-hmm. managers. They don't know what's fucking good. No, I had a manager tell me, he came and saw, he was like, show me some seven minute sets, or whatever. And I showed him two and 15, you know, back to back sevens. And then afterwards, like, yeah, it's fine. It's B plus, A minus set. Just a weekday at the comedy store. And then afterwards, he was like, what was that, man? I mean, that was terrible. And I was like, what? He goes, I mean, that bit, you're doing a bit about doing that i mean shitting yourself like you can't and i was like hey just so you know i went to the montreal comedy festival and everyone there loved that right so instead of trying to think why something's not good imagine what is good about it right and that's you what i mean open up your whole because world because most of these people they have a standard and they don't have the creativity yeah to see beyond that um like so I if, said, it's, if it's not normal if you don't get a super attractive actress then right. you can't see it that i can see it super attractive actress yeah i can launch you Right. But other than that, it's like there's other people that are hitting. That guy from Eastbound and Down. Right. Who helped him? Someone had a smart idea about that guy. Because they just thought he was funny. Yeah. And his character was funny. It's like when I was when I was saying this about Kimmel, nobody thought that the, the Perry project that we were yeah. working on, and we just kept doing it. it. Before we met Kimmel, we had worked on it seven years with nothing. People just hated it. And, and then Kimmel. Kimmel came around, and then and you know what? When you mentioned the Montreal Comedy Festival, we won Top Honors Best Film at the Montreal oh, Comedy yeah. Festival. So it went from something that people are saying that's oh, worthless to a, an award-winning film. It's so weird how you get someone like Kimmel just to put their stamp on it, and people are like, oh, well, let's look at it and now. And now everybody, you know, because Jimmy would put the, I mean, I uh, about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago when they were promoting Beavis and Butthead, yeah. to sit there with Mike Judge and to have him, oh, I've seen this a hundred times. and it's seen sit, what a hundred times? The Windy City wow. Heat, and to sit with him and have him watch and explain to his friends what's going on, and like, holy shit, this is yeah. unbelievable. There's tons of people that love it. Uh, yeah. Eminem is a huge fan. He actually had us come and meet him during one of his video shoots, God. and I remember, I remember the quote: "I've seen it tens of times. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the movie." <laughs> But I mean, it, it, he Tarantino won- was a fan too, right? Or yeah, is that, yeah, yeah. He was. I mean, so a lot of people, like, uh, oh, you like, know what? Can, I tell, can we tell a story about when I was in Kimmel? Yeah. I just realized that I was sitting there with with my ex at the time. Oh, I was still going. I was still married to her then. But like, um, and we fucked around in the audience. You did warm up and stuff, and you yeah. did this one thing where like, you asked the crowd like, who has the best prison story? Like, <laughs> who's um, who's been depressed? So a couple people talked. It's like, yeah, I got put in jail for selling weed. Somebody else like yeah, I stole a car. And then you caught my eye from all the way across, and I kind of like raised my hand. 
and you trust me enough. Well, because before you go into it, I'll just yeah. say this. Don't forget the story. Because there's very few people that play improv well. Because uh-huh. in, what's the the biggest rule of improv? Don't deny. Yeah. And no matter what's pitched at you, you find the even if you don't like it, you find a funny way out of it. And that's what you are spectacular at. Thanks, man. Okay, go ahead. So I see and you. So, so you're like, okay, you do one more. You make your way over to me. And then you're like, oh, you, sir, oh, pretending like you didn't know me. You're like, uh, what have you been in jail for? And then you lean in and you go, no Jew stuff, no Jew stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> which you definitely should say because you're like, I know you'll be funny, but I don't know if you know the line. <laughs> so you're like, yeah. this is network television. Well, and it's like, you know, and I don't even do the that anymore. I mean, it was like oh, yeah. maybe the greatest show ever that I did the audience warm up for because, like I what, said. That Jim- show? No, oh, the man like, show. Oh, uh, yeah. You could do whatever you wanted there. Absolutely. And it was like, uh, and one of the best things, I think that it was like, I pulled a prank on the audience. Uh, do you think your audience is familiar with Brian Holtzman? No. Nope. Okay. Definitely not. Brian Holtzman is a, he's a hilarious. Unique, he, he's, he's, of all the angry comics, he's yeah. the one that seems like he's faking it the least. Right. He And it's just, but I think he's great. He's a great yeah. guy. And so he he wanted to come and see the man show. Yeah. But he said he could only stay for one show. And like they oh, have they the, tape a few in a row. Uh, yeah, they would tape two at least. Okay. All right. So now it's between the shows, and I'm doing the audience warm up. And he said he wanted to leave. You mm-hmm. know, and I knew he wanted to leave. And so I said, just bear with me. I'm going to do something with you. And so, first man <laughs> show ends, and now I come out there. Okay, we're going to do another show real quick. But I do have some bad news here. And I told security to help me, so they were the only ones in on it. <laughs> yeah. I said, cameras caught a guy during the show masturbating. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's really that funny, but the you have to... I just know Holtzman, I guess. That believes that this is happening. So I said, and so I start slowly walking <laughs> up. And I said, this is obviously, you can't do this. And sir, and I went up and finally walked all the way up the stairs, talking the entire way, why you should, sir, why did you do this? Right to Holtzman. Right to Holtzman. Yeah. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> and securities, to, get your hands off me, get your hands. But he I didn't never... say, no, I wasn't doing it, because I couldn't help myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so they took him out, but the whole audience really believed that that had happened. That's the best way. He was like, I got to leave. That's the best way I can Absolutely. leave. Absolutely. Oh it was, my God. it was spectacular. It wow. was spectacular. Wow. So you came over to me then. And you're like, what's your, what's your thing? And I had just seen that movie, Hurricane, the story of that boxer, Hurricane right. Carter. So I said, well, I was actually a, a, a championship level boxer, and uh, they, I was in prison for a crime I didn't commit. And a young, young African American kid uh, took up my case, and he freed me. Uh, he he proved me my innocence. You could hear people murmuring like a couple people like, "Is that her, is a plot of hurricane?" <laughs> like, 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 like what? Anyway, so the only reason I was there is Morgan Murphy invited me because she was doing stand up. Right. But um, Tarantino was a guest, and I love Tarantino. Wow, he's my favorite director. He really is spectacular. And you know what? It's what's really funny about a guy like that. Yeah. There's people that you see that you just look at them. They just enjoy life, man. Yeah. He just loves living. That guy drives, you know the pussy mobile from, from Kill Bill? Right. He drives that around. Right. Well, y- here's here's <laughs> the thing that was like, because like a lot of those people on the sh- that come on the show, yeah. they're there and y- they're nice to everybody. Yeah. But when Jimmy's not there, they're they gone. They shut off. Yeah. Right. They're, it's it's no longer they're nice to everybody. Now they're just on their own or they're, they leave. Yeah. Uh, I remember one night when Quentin was on the show. Yeah. After he comes in Jimmy's office, Jimmy leaves. He stays there because he wants to talk about movies. Wow. I mean, it was the coolest thing. I remember uh, kind of getting in an argument with him. Oh, why can't I think of the guy? Michael Moore. About yeah. Michael Moore, how he twists everything. And he didn't think he did? Well, he didn't. But everyone else, because I said something against it, and he was like siding with Michael Moore on something. Yeah. People that I work with were like, oh, like turn it on me. Of course they would, because that's a famous guy. Right. You're not. Exactly. You know what you're talking about, Don. Like, but Quentin Tarantino, guys? no, I understand what he's saying. Yeah. I mean, he's the coolest dude. I'm sure he must get kissed up to all the time. Oh, absolutely. So we can't get a real conversation. Right. But it was, wow. it's, he's, he's a cool guy. So anyway, so he comes out and um, does his first interview, first uh, segment. 
And then in between, they take a commercial break, and they're sitting there because they're going to do another segment. And I'm up in the audience a little bit, and he's staring like in my oh. direction. And it just looked, it was like weird because he's like staring. And I'm like, is there a monitor behind me or something that he's looking at? It was like odd. But I'm, you know, 100 yards away from him. And then he does a segment, does a second segment where they have a, like a Quentin Tarantino like fanatic. And they have a trivia contest to see who knows more about Tarantino. Right. This fanatic or Tarantino. And I think he lost to the fanatic. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty fun. Uh, and then he sits down for a sec- the second commercial and he's staring again. And I'm like, this is fucking weird. And then I see him call you over. And he like emotions like right. over here, and he whispers something to you, and then you come over to me, <laughs> and you said, "What did you say to me?" Uh, I know it was about the, uh, the your movie. So yeah, he goes. He wanted to know if if that's the amazing racist, right? <laughs> yeah, he saw you fucking around with me during warm up, right? He saw that. Yeah, and he saw you. So absolutely, I was he, like, wow, that's so fucking cool. Because he's just such a fan of movies, man. Yeah, that is the coolest. So loves life. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I got to give a word to our sponsor. You have sponsors? Yeah, adamandeve.com. They're sponsoring this episode. How do you, how do you get that? Um, people, I don't know, eventually offer <laughs> to get really? sponsorship. Yeah. T- tell them that I want them to sponsor us. Okay. Well, we have ASM Plumbing and Porn on ours. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, too. And you have... Um, you have uh, What the Huck. What the Huck at the Huck's <laughs> Restaurant. <laughs> right. But adamandeve.com, I just have to say this, is a, uh, is a website where you can get like... Um, lube and lingerie and uh dildos and all sorts of stuff what do you get from there i have not uh gotten much from there yet but if i wanted to i'd get dvds but I, i'm not like an internet porn guy um if they had uh, any sort of smoother sock so i can meet, masturbate into my sock and some sort of uh with frills on it i would buy that <laughs> i'm pretty simple but they have like fleshlights and stuff what's and a flashlight like, flashlight's a male dildo it's like a, it's pretty much a pocket vagina you know who you, oh, inside <laughs> Let's just say one big comic yeah. that I used to open on the road for, but don't mention his okay. name. Okay. I think he found one of those yeah. and liked it so much. But to make himself feel like, hey, this isn't Not weird. weird to do, yeah. he would buy everybody <sighs> yeah. their own pocket. <laughs> That's enabling. Like, That's when pill heads do that. Like, hey, take this pill. I'm like, oh, I'm cool. They're like, no, I need you to because I'm doing it. So right. I need you to also. But he would buy all of his friends these pocket <laughs> vaginas, vaginas and the lube. And I, I was going to the impression of when I <laughs> yeah, almost did. I would have given it away. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty easy impression. Right. Um, but yeah, and if you go there now and put in the code Ari at checkout, this is what they give you. They give you three free DVDs, free shipping, one free item, and 50% off another item. Wait a minute. If you say Ari. No, and you're mispronouncing it actually by accident. It's uh, Ari. What is? My name. Seriously? Yeah. It's weird. Did you change it for show business? No, no. It's always been Ari. I've known you for like but a if, decade or more. if you say Ari, yeah. they will give you three DVDs? You punch it in, yeah. Really? Three free DVDs. That's the, that's the, that's the thing. That's the Do you give. have to buy anything? Oh, no. You have to buy 50% off one item. That's the thing. Oh, 50, but they get 50% off the item. Yeah. Then you get three DVDs. Three DVDs, a free item. I don't, that's like a surprise item. And free shipping. So really? pretty much you get one half so price thing. Get, you get something half off, and then you get all this free stuff. Yeah, just for it's saying, a pretty good deal. All right, it is a the good first deal. time I read it out loud was on when I was doing the first promo, and I was just reading like, and you get three free. free Jesus, that's a good like as a Jew, <laughs> that's a fucking solid <laughs> deal. It really is. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get back to the Dignar show. I want to talk about this a little more because the one fun thing I had um, that I noticed is as an audience member, comedians who go up there. It's Monday night; they have the open mic night downstairs, and then the Dignar shows upstairs. So right. we. You let the audience sort of get involved. If they want. I yeah. let whatever, ha- because it's never the same thing. Oh, it's never the same thing. It's always, and it's a reality. And it's they something. might do the same act, but new things come up every time. Right. A new person will be in the room that throws them off or something. Right, and it'll be delivered in a different way. Yeah, exactly. so you have this guy named, um, so you can ask, people can ask questions sometimes. You open it up to the floor for people to ask questions of the of the people. Right. And you have this guy, Sam, the Armenian comedian. Right. Is he in there anymore or not? Uh, well, he tried suing me. <laughs> okay. Because one girl threw a match at a friend of his because he didn't like, he didn't like Katie. Yeah. Oh. Be, he'd fight with her, and so he wanted her out. So he brought this other girl that supposedly was talented, and she was just a fucking slob. Yeah. And it rubbed everybody the wrong way because she's one of these... We really high energy, but I'm just a real con. Is what oh, I am. yeah. And uh, so she got in fights with everybody and sort of ruined things, too. right? So eventually, Sam took her side and wants 
tried to sue us and all. Wow. I go, Sam, you're not going to get any money from anybody. How many different people have? How many different times have you been sued, or attempted to be sued? The, well, but the thing is, the only saving grace on not being sued a lot more, yeah, is it costs money to file papers. Yeah, it does cost a few bucks. What's that? It's, it costs a little bit to file uh, papers. A few hundred dollars. Yeah, four hundred, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's. You know. They told me when I when I that when I was trying to I had to find a lawyer to represent me, to, uh, to write up the paperwork when that guy sued me, and luckily I finally found one who would do it pro bono. Right. But I would pay for like the paperwork and stuff, and it was a few hundred bucks. And they said, "Well, we can we can sue him back for the money." And I was like, "You know what? I have brought this on myself. I'll just right. pay for it." He doesn't have any money anyway. Right. But Sam, the way my angle was, since he's Armenian, I just took it as well. That's an Arab, and as a Jew, I'm just gonna <laughs> boo everything he says and just hate him with all my might. He is an amazing guy, uh, Sam. And I, I, actually, Jimmy Kimmel was the guy that brought him to me because he had been on oh. K Rock Radio oh, all yeah. the time. And he recently was banned from there because he said he was going to. They they played a dirty trick on him. I think it's kind of cold. What because, was the dirty trick? Well, they told him he was going to open like their acoustic christmas or their weenie mm-hmm. roast which is a huge huge rock concert oh, yeah, K- yeah, both of those yeah, k k rock is the most powerful k rock is the station wherever you live in america when they play like sort of modern rock right and what they k rock chooses what they exactly play. their set list what they play is used by everyone across yeah. with it's, a few different alterations based on local bands but just very very few right and so what they do what's really crazy is they're so powerful when they have these concerts Anybody who's in that musical genre, they get them to perform. So you see amazing yeah. concerts. So he's going to open up. That's what they tell him. He's going to open up a stand-up? Yeah. Okay. He also plays the flute. I don't know if that right. was, that was perhaps. Yeah. And uh, and he, well, so he's gonna open. Side, when you go through that, don't forget the fact he's a ventriloquist. <laughs> see, the one thing about Sam, everything he does. <laughs> I forgot about the ventriloquism. Is That's so bad. He is so bad at it. He doesn't have one ounce of talent, but he has more confidence oh, than anyone so I've ever much. seen. But I'll tell you this: a guy, he he's actually fat and bald, and he thinks he can fuck every woman that's right. ever walked by him. Oh, and he tries to. And yeah, the, and he's married to a woman that's very attractive. He's the luckiest guy in the world. <laughs> and what's funny? There's another one. When when Kimmel first started, they yeah. couldn't get guests. So they always oh, yeah. had Sam as a standby because he knew him from, and when the first week Snoop Dogg was the the co-host, yeah. so the Armenian comedian Sam came out and did ventriloquism, and I don't know if Snoop Dogg was high as hell, but he was crying. He was laughing so it's hard. It's so bad. He moves his lips more right. almost when he does right. the ventriloquist. Voice. The ventriloquist. The ventriloquist act is maybe the funniest. thing. He keeps thing. moving the ventriloquist mouth when he's talking right. as himself. <laughs> right. It's just like it's just it's, everything you could do. Wrong. You couldn't even keep up with how many wrong things. Right. You couldn't it, emulate it. It's too much wrong. But I mean, uh, Snoop brought him backstage and got him high as hell. Really? And and he came out and said, "That is the strongest weed I have ever <laughs> had in my life." <laughs> so, um, but you you go on with Sam. So you you're right. Yeah, but he's such a bad guy. Yeah, and then when he sees me, he's like, "You fucking Jew! You not kosher piece right. of shit, oh. kosher bitch." And he he just argues with anybody. But he's yeah. he was the perfect villain. Yeah, that's what I miss. I don't have that villain yeah. anymore. The one time, remember, he was like, "You know nothing about Armenia. We started culture." Right, he kept saying that. And so one time, I was like, "You know nothing about Armenia." <laughs> So what I did was I remember this. I went online, just researched facts about Armenia <laughs> from like the the first century on, and I just handed them out to different people. So people were like Jeff Danis, all these people were like yelling, and I'm like, Sam, this act is worse than King Nebuchadnezzar of the 1480s, who was overthrown within two years. <laughs> and I would just kept yelling Armenian yeah, facts at him. It was, it was, it was. But I like that you're open enough to let that shit happen. Well, because that's what it is. Yeah, it's it's improv. It's so much fun when you're in one of those situations. Yeah, and it's uh, and the and that's what's cool because a lot of comics come up there and they play. Yeah, and some of them eh, they aren't that funny, but some of them are. And yeah, it makes it great. Oh, absolutely. And you manage to keep the unfunny ones to a minimum, and right? You sort of move the funnier ones forward so that it can. Sh- it's just it's just a great show. It's just a fun well, show. I just I I'm trying to get more people to pick up on it, and I and hopefully it can because I mean some people go like every week to watch. Yeah. There was a, it was like crazy. There was a, a while there were the, 
I didn't know what they produced exactly, but the, oh yeah, that's that producer from this show and all that. Mm-hmm. And a group of people were coming every week, and it's like, and they would just come up. This is so brilliant. Yeah. And people, but I I just don't know what to do to take it from a level of like okay, people like it. it's not everybody's cup of tea. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Definitely but not. people that like it love it. Love it. Yeah. And but how do I get more people to love it? Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's all a question of getting to know about it. Well, the, so the, things like this help a little, but yeah. like, yeah, well, that's that's what I understand. And by the way, if anyone hears anyone from this podcast goes to watch, you should mention it that you came from this podcast. Oh, can I say this to yeah. the people? And I'll, I'll make this challenge. Yeah. All right. Uh, any Monday night yeah. that anybody that has heard this podcast, yeah, the first hundred of you get in for free. First hundred. Wow, that's a really good. Uh, <laughs> that's a really good offer. And how how much is it normally if you just didn't hear this? It's, well, it's free. Okay, cool. But that's a great deal, though. Hundreds for free is way better than one for free. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might feel bad if you bring like fifty of your friends, and it's like, oh, do we really want to do that? But now that you know, the first hundred get in free. <laughs> You're so good at goofy. I, I when I started the store, the the reason she said, but I think it's right. The reason Mitzi made like comedians work the door and work the cover booth. And stuff like that, is so they can watch comedians. That that became part of her thing. I, I oh. do know that that's what she, just she did it for felt. free labor. I, I sometimes believe <laughs> yeah. that that was originally the reason. Yeah. But go, but go on. But uh, what I did is I picked up on a lot of different people who do who either funny, not funny, or, or not. But they do one thing better than anyone else that I've seen. Like Steve Simone has become a great storyteller on stage. Right. You know. So and, and I remember Freddie Soto being a great storyteller. And when I, when I watched him, I was like, if I need to tell a story and I can't figure out how to do, it, I'd watch him. I was like, oh, interesting. Okay, I see techniques. And you do Goofy so fucking well on stage, where I could see you go like to like older ladies, like sixty year olds, seventy year olds, and you'd be like, you fucking dirty whore. Oh, you want to get railed, don't you? But you do it with such a smile that they would love it. Well, you know what? As they I, would love it. I was saying before. I don't like stand up as an art form and what I try to do I'm not doing stand up. Here's my goal when I go yeah. on stage every night. I want to control the audience to the point where whatever I say they're with you. They're with me. Huh. And that's selling myself and that can be used in anything. And I think a while back I have a uh uh a joke about a pickle jar. Oh yeah, it's a great joke. You okay, back. well, oh, it's it's, weird. it's it's not it's not that it's a great joke, but it's it's disgusting. Yeah, and it's I funny remember to laugh at it. and what I did about two months ago. There was a priest in there, and he had some people in there. Wow, clearly all churchgoers. Yeah, why would they have the comedy store? Yeah, <laughs> I, I have no, for you. no, absolutely not. And it was late night too, so that's even crazier. As it gets later, it gets dirtier. But what my goal was when I went up there, yeah. I said, I'm going to make him laugh at the pickle jar, at the story? Pickle jar story. And I'm telling you, now I, I went through it a different way than I normally do, and I was very clean, very, yeah. you know, but I got their entire group to like me, and I brought them down that trail, and I saw this priest pounding on the table. Really? Uh, at that at joke. a filthy joke. Overly right. filthy. Yeah, and it was like, so that, to me... Tell the joke. Can you tell it? It'd be too weird to not be on stage because it's a uh, joke joke. So I don't know. It's yeah. I don't right. really do joke. Well, one it, thing you can see is Don Bear pretty much every night at the end of the night at the comedy store, like one thirty on, he yeah. will be on and just take over and they do like a, a lip sync band. What? You, oh, you don't have a band? The Barris Kennedy Overdrive. <laughs> Barris Kennedy up. Overdrive. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's a it, fun thing to stay for, especially right. if you're up late. Exactly, and it was like, and the crazy thing is, like the comedy store has the best vibe anywhere for a true late night craziness. There's yeah. no other place. When I first came there, that's where Sam Kennison went up. And I'll tell you. He went, went up late, right? He went up last. Wouldn't he come in at like 1 o'clock and be like, I'll go on next? One thirty, sometimes We're not even o'clock. bumping anybody. No. And people would come because they knew Kennison was right. coming in late. You would see, this is what was crazy about that. You, now, it would get busier it, as it goes. In this day and age at the comedy store, when I say, yeah, there'd be only like 25 people. Oh, that'd be a great show. Right. Now <laughs> it'd be like, whoa. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, but there'd be 25 people in there. Sam would come on and the place would get half full. But it wasn't just like people. Yeah. It was like, I remember uh, Toto in there with Rosanna Arquette, the 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 girl that they wrote Rosanna 
the song Roseanne about. Really? Yeah. Oh, they thought about Roseanne Arquette? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did, I didn't know that. Here's another one I'll bet you didn't know. I'll no, bet but... you don't even know this song. There's a song by Bob Seger called Her Strut. It's really no, just... Know. All right. Anyway, it's written about Jane Fonda. Really? But it's just a dirty f- song. Wow. And I, Jane Fonda, when she was on Kimmel, was talking about it. And I actually saw Bob Seger the other night, and he talked about it. Wow. That's so cool. It's, yeah, wearing a but Bob I mean, Seger shirt right now. I sure am. Bob Seger. 2011-2012 shirt. Oh, wow. That's a new one. Yeah. Well, oh, wow. I just saw him the other night. It's not even 2012 yet. <laughs> <laughs> it will be when this airs, but it's New so, Year's Eve right now. So he... Uh, oh, we're good. Uh, should we end this? No, no. It's okay. Uh, where was I going? Hmm. This happens a lot to me. What? Did you, to lose track of where I was. you cut this out? No, nah, I'll probably figure out how to get there. Unless it goes on for like another three minutes of us just going, hmm, hmm. Um, oh, we were talking about making the priest laugh and doing this goofy thing you do, which uh, is making everybody well, laugh. But, uh, band. Uh, oh, yeah. We're Bam. talking about the comedy story. Yeah. No, it, it's just... Oh, Kennison coming in late, yeah. It, and it's just such a great history of that kind of stuff. But I mean, even Bob Seger. I remember when I first came there, I remember watching Bob Seger there all the time. To you see just Sam. come? Really? Yeah. Wow. Sit by himself. Yeah. Dave Grohl comes sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it's just, but it's not, I mean, every, it was like, you would see, uh, and it, now it doesn't mean anything, but, uh, oh, why can't I think of his name? What's he like? What's his Porn name? guy. Ron Jeremy. Ron Jeremy. Show up all the time. Ron Jeremy was there every single night, and he'd always have all these porn stars with him. It was just like yeah. a crazy, crazy place. One of the weirdest moments I've ever had, I was walking through um, Hollywood and Highland when it just opened up. That mall there, right? I was with Mike Black. I was going to meet Mike Black for a movie, and I came across Joe Rogan, who I barely knew. Like I just had sort of met him a little bit. And I was like, "Oh, hey, how you doing, man?" He's like, "Good. How are you? We just came from this. Where are you, where are you going?" And then Ron Jeremy comes up, and they all we all start talking. I'm like, "I'm fucking here with Ron Jeremy and the fucking news radio guy." And then I stayed there for like five minutes, and then Mr. Belding from <laughs> from what's it called? From um, Mr. Belding. Yeah, from that show. I don't know. Saved by the Bell. Oh. The principal from Saved by the Bell came by and was like, hey, guys. And they all kind of like blew him off. And then I was like, this is fucking weird. I'm going to watch this movie. That can be weird. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I... Late night, that vibe there is really fucking sweet. Yeah, and it's like... And, and you're the king of that place. And I'll, and I'll tell you something that's interesting. It seems like they're kind of like... They're what? kind of wanting to promote things a little bit more. Yeah. Because it's what the comedy store specializes yeah. in. It's tough because it is late, so most people are sleeping. Right, but it's But still, if those that are up... But not even that. But I think that like the comedy story, you, you were there when we were talking to Paulie the other day. Uh huh. Yeah. I just I have a lot of hope for what the comedy they're going to push it can. more and like the, the, really the whole to, like, thing can be. Because, the great thing about that place is they really are artist first, business second. Right. And unlike any other comedy club, ever. and it's weird. They don't really do any promotion, and they're and they don't have bringer shows in their main shows. Right. And they're busier night after night than the other clubs. Right. It, without papering the rooms or anything like that. It's just a good place. Anyway, I, I would like to uh, ask your people, start listening to my uh, podcast. They will. They will. <laughs> will they? <laughs> yeah. They'll uh, give it a chance. I know Morrissey. I interviewed him about, he, he played college basketball. You know Morrissey? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's a huge fan of that stuff. He always listens. The Big Three podcast. Really? Yeah, he's a huge fan of that. He always asks me about it. When we play basketball, he's like, hey, so let me ask you a question. Now, when Perry says this to Don, does he really mean this or does he really? like it? Oh, yeah. He's a humongous fan. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, you could talk to him about it. He like loves that shit. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it's not for everybody, but if it's for the people that it's for, it's so for. Yeah. That ding dong show, that whole vibe. Well, come on and uh, follow me on Facebook, Don Barris. I want that. I don't know how to promote myself. Is this? Yeah, am I doing hard. a bad job doing no, it? No, podcasts are a great idea. But I'm saying saying it right now. No, it's okay. You. But you've said it. Have I? Yeah, they they, they got it. They can go my Twitter is simply Don One. Yeah, they got it. Am I, so am keep saying Facebook it won't help Don that much more. It doesn't yeah. help. No, no. So I should shut my mouth. Maybe. <laughs> it's okay. All right. But now let me ask you a question about the thing that I show a little bit. Yeah. Have you ever, when you see somebody that you can't contain or you can't control, what do you do at that point? Uh, like Boone Shakalaka. Yeah. So like how do you get rid of someone like that? Just, you know what? You're gone. Mickey's another one. Uh-huh. Mickey was like good for a little bit, but you couldn't. He he was he's funny. So creepy. He's so he creepy, drunk. and he's so out of his mind. And I just think, and I think part of him, and, and I know the people out there, they have no idea who Mickey is. Uh, he's just he's a drunk. He's and he's a real character. He looks like he uh, he looks like Sam Elliott. 
Yeah. A little like if anybody sh- watches Shameless. Yeah. He is like the, the, the father from Shameless. And so he's like, could be considered a good looking guy, but just yeah. doesn't do anything. Uh-uh. Doesn't do anything. And so I would try to put him in this show and I would do things. I would have him try to say things that I thought that he had said before was funny. Yeah. Like, uh, the way he would say something and I'd try to have him say it again and he could never he do it repeat. and I think he was just bullshitting me I think he was bullshitting me and I finally said oh, really? like he was trying yeah he was trying not to do what I wanted him I to do I have seen that a few times where people like try to be seem nuts and it's like no you can't try you right. just gotta sort of be you right you know you can't emulate it and people don't get that and those people don't work out the weird thing was Mitzi I can't believe I almost forgot to say this when I when I started at the comedy store Right. I was like working there, I was getting shit on, I couldn't get anything. I'm just trying to get become a paid regular. Well, first of all, paid. before yeah. before you go into that, uh-huh. it's like uh uh I finally convinced Mitzi. Mitzi's I, I got to the point where I had kind of a relationship with Mitzi where I was, yeah. I was scared to death of this woman. In my eyes, one of the most power and we're talking about the Mitzi Shore, the owner of the comedy store. Yeah. Or to you kids that are now in the middle of uh <laughs> your thirties, uh Polly's mother, yeah. Polly Shore's mother. And, but she was so powerful and so yeah. like, if she liked you, she was nice. Open if she gates. didn't get Fuck away you. from me. Yeah. And so I, she had never really understood, but I convinced her about Robert Apravaya, who is to me the ultimate ding donger. Yeah. He is the ultimate guy because. How would you describe him? Well, he, it's kind of crazy because he's a paranoid schizophrenic. Okay. And I actually got to the point where I would talk to psychologists to try to tell me what he was doing. Now, here's a guy, a little bit about his history. He's a guy that in high school was the vice president of his junior and senior year in high school. So you think about usually in that, that's a popularity contest. Uh He went on to play to college and he played college basketball now it might have been jv level whatever but still State in college, college you, yeah he yeah. he averaged 15.1 points a game wow then he went to law school yeah so all this now you think at about that, that point it's like well so the world here, world's your oyster here's an athlete a guy that can get into law school so he yeah. has brains you know all this stuff and he must have been popular to be vice president of his yeah. class and it just hit him, and he just went insane. But the history, the very first time the I- schizophrenia hit him. Yeah. And paranoia. Very first time, I, and it's funny because I've watched him transfer, excuse me, I watched him transform from this guy that would have, his beard used to be this thing that was like, he must have spent hours just cutting it perfectly. You it saw was, him when he was normal? It wasn't normal because- the very first time I ever walked in the comedy store, I saw him on stage. This guy wears a the same green jacket. He did. All the time. He From wears... 1974 that he bought oh, at yeah, Kmart until, yeah, and he just bought a new one. And he wears it... plastic shopping bags in his, pretty much his collar. Well, or over he does head. that because he puts it on his head. And the reason being is because he walks a lot, and a lot of his walking, he comes from downtown Los Angeles up to West Hollywood. <sighs> And in that walk, like catching buses, walk? well, he catches oh, he buses, buses and okay. things like that. But he figures the foot pressure for the weight that it would cost from the plastic bags to a hat, the extra weight would put X amount of foot pressure. On on his knees and stuff? Yes. <laughs> That's why he has plastic bags instead of a hat. And this is the guy, when you, when you if you if you ever slam on the table at all, if, you, if you're like laughing so hard that you like slap a table... He thinks, or if you do it on purpose, but he thinks that is vibrational frequencies who can very, very slowly lead to his death. Right, exactly. So he is actually to that point. No, but I've watched it. It's just so. But I had convinced Mitzi, you can't because she wanted to get rid of him because yeah, he had been the, too much. He had been the closing act at the comedy store on the potluck night for years and years. And I said, yeah. this is a tradition, and she actually started to listen to me. Then and he I closes out that. It's so weird. So, right. So he's been there. Think about it. He's been doing that since before it was, when it wasn't the comedy store. What do you mean? Really? There was a, there was a period that it wasn't the comedy store. There was a, the, the people that had the lease, uh, said, you know what, what we're going to do 
instead of letting Mitzi run the club, we're going to open our own comedy club. So they changed the name of the comedy club. And then what Mitzi did is she went behind their backs yeah. and bought it from the owners. Oh, nice. Right. So then she threw that guy out. But for a short period, maybe a couple months, maybe a month, it was a different comedy club. And he was coming around then. And that's when he started. And this is in the when 70s. Was it? Okay. So he's been doing this his entire time. So now. Uh, I was just kind of given a background of what he is. Yeah. And so now you were telling the story about him. Um, well, he's there. He closes out the show every every, every Sunday year. and Monday now, Pollock yeah. Show. He he thought, he t- attended a lot of tapings of um, The Tonight Show with Johnny Oh, that's Carson. another thing. He thought he was going to take, his major, major thing with me, he, he thought, you. well, because he thinks I work for Jay Leno, because yeah. he thought he was in line to take over when Johnny Carson retired. And when Jay Leno got it, because from what I understand, a paranoid schizophrenic, if they can't understand why something happened, they have to make a reason why yeah, it happened. Yeah, yeah. So he made... The, you know what? Regular people like that, too. Right. Or anything where happens wrong to them, like, this guy must have said some shit behind my back. And it's like, look inwards, man. Right. Maybe that person just didn't like you or someone else is more qualified. Couldn't be that. Exactly. People never want to face that. And that's what. And so now he started blaming me for working for Jay Leno. Oh, wow. So, and the guy that stopped him, he won't even call him Jay Leno. He calls him Lemon Jello. <laughs> yeah, as an insult. Yeah, and, and Mitzi eventually got him to be part of the Ding Dong Show. That's the reason that the Ding Dong Show movie never came out, because the guy I was working with, I said all along, you know, they completed it. It's edited. Oh, it's yeah. ready to go. But the guy, so I said, what? if you take him out, yeah. Robert Appervive, because to me... He's the main reason I do any of this. I just was so amazed by him. Like I said, the very first time I ever saw him, he was on stage. Very first time I ever went in the comedy store. There yeah. was two people in the room. Sam Kinison and his friend Carla Beau were throwing chairs at him. And I was watching what he would do. He would put his finger under his nose, and I never figured it out. Later, I found out that protects him against Nazis. Oh. Uh, and... But there each was a Nazi time, Nazi voodoo conspiracy, right? The Nazi voodoo conspiracy that continues to violate the rights of Robert William Apravaya. But every time somebody would throw a chair at him, or Kinnison was yeah. throwing chairs at him, he would walk over the side, put his finger underneath his nose, then he would come back and pick it up on the last word he left off on. Like so if it's he, a script, it's got to be a word exactly. for a word exactly. So if he was saying, "So I went to the show and I got," and wait ten minutes, seven programs, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he'd pick it up on the next word. Yeah, I'm sorry, but you were you were saying something about Robert. Well, when I saw when I first started seeing him, I got there and I saw this thing, and it became like it was coming like almost like Rocky Horror Picture Show, right? Where all these people, there was this thing where he would where he would, I didn't understand it. It was everybody in the back. He was doing this act out of whatever, and he goes, "We're going about," and everyone starts saying, "Hey, Robert, watch out! There's a tear in the carpet. You need to watch out for the carpet, Robert." And it would start like two minutes. For a while, people like, Robert, I'm just telling you, do whatever you do, but please be careful with that thing on the carpet. And he has this part of his act where he pretends to trip. <laughs> and <laughs> so you guys get this lead up of like, watch out for the tear in the carpet, like minutes beforehand. And then everybody, we warned you. We warned you, you Robert. We told you about the tear. <laughs> uh, what I was saying is that Mitzi put me, when she was suggested, like she saw me, I was, I was working the cover booth and stuff, and she saw me on stage, and she goes, hey, I've got this show for you that I want to put you in. And I was like, really? Awesome. The owner, the most powerful woman at the store, and I was like, "That's amazing." She goes, "Yeah, it's a ding dong show, and you're going to really thrive there." I was like, "Thank you so much, Mitzi." Oh my god! I told my girlfriend about it. I was so goddamn excited. Your, your name was on the flyer. My name was on the flyer. Yeah. This is when I convinced Mitzi, and she renamed it the Ding Dong Show, and she was going to be my partner, and she was saying that I could bring cameras in there. Yeah. And, and you know, now if you look at things, uh, there's cameras everywhere. Yeah. But before. It was like no way. There, you nobody yeah, yeah. had cameras, and it, who else was on that list? Favorman, Mike, Mike Favorman. Favorman. Yeah. yeah. And so and, we got there, and I was like, oh, I'm going to do my act. And then you realize it's this nutty place. <laughs> I think I did it twice. And I'm like, oh, this isn't for me. And I felt so bad. I'm like, she thought I was for the show for the crazy people. I, what? I thought that was my break, and it was just the opposite. Oh, it worked out for you. It and did work Favorman, out fine. But well, I remember bringing my girlfriend there to watch, and I was like, oh, my God, having no idea what this was. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, there you go. So, yeah. But you're original ding-donger. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, one of them. I don't know what I was going to say about Robert. Well, no, you were saying that he was in the sh- show, too. Oh, yeah, he was in the show then, yeah. What? He was in the show. And you just couldn't use him? Oh. Hi, Mary Jane. 
Another yeah. member of the Ding Dong Show. Member of the Ding Dong Show. She actually helps produce the Ding Dong Show. Oh, very nice. Everybody say hi to Mary Jane. Mary Jane, say hello to everybody. Hello. It's, not, it's on. not on. But that's it's not on. She said hello. Go over here and say hello. She uh, she's also helps me produce not only uh, the Ding Dong Show, but she actually helps me produce the Big Three Podcast. Say hello, Mary Jane. Hello. That's very nice. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's great. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I've seen. How do you find the people? Because uh, it's not from the. It's not from potluck anymore. No, it isn't. It, it's it's people that I come across. It's like Brian, like Brian Cosme, uh-huh. who became a staple yeah, uh, for a long time. I met him when I was doing the audience warm up for Win Ben Stein's Money. Because he would sit there and it was a free paycheck, 50 bucks? Right. It is it is one of these shows that they pay the audience members because they tape like four or five shows a day. And no one's going to sit there for that? Nobody yeah. cares about, you know. It's the, not a tonight show where they can get fans to go. Right. So so they, but his whole family would come there and they would sleep. And, and I, <laughs> but I'd bring him down and he had this innocence and he would tell these jokes that made no sense at all. And he just, but he did it with such gusto and it was like. What he, he was great. He was the king of Poontang. He's the king of Poontang. Yeah. Wow. And um how many have you seen pass away during your time? Uh well, there was a guy, Lean Jean. Oh yeah, Lean Jean. Yeah. He was a guy that was like about a three hundred pound guy. I did open mics with him. Right. And it was just because during the show and it's kinda sad because you just see him breathing. You'd hear him. <sighs> He was like a pug. Yeah. Uh, Blue Iris passed away. Who uh-huh. else has passed away, Mary Jane? Big Mama? No, Big Mama is not dead. Oh. She um she was best friends with Blue Iris, and I think it was really hard on her when Blue Iris died. They lived together. Oh, yeah. And well, then she had several strokes. Yeah, and... several. That's but you know what? More than none. But... She's retired nicely with a loving family. Okay. Well, what, what's funny about her, Big Mama Macintosh... What she Mama just wanted to be in show business so bad. Yeah. And when we did the movie, her idea, she wanted them to take video of her, the the film crew, when they were doing an interview with her. Yeah. While she was taking a bath. Whoa. She's so, this fat old black lady. Yeah. And she just, and it, but it was like she wanted to show her body. Yeah, she, she was comfortable with it. And and that It's like you know what I got? One of those overly yeah. confident you're like confident in what? Yeah, but the but point somehow. is, in her mind it was beautiful. Yeah. And you know what? Because of that, and I'll tell it you this off. I miss her because she was she would do anything for me. Mm-hmm. And it was very funny. One night we uh You did a thing I remember where it was like it was it was the thing that show medical staff, that was the sketch. Right. And uh, like they had these sketches, but then it is reality show based on the sort of the sketch. It's like them really trying to get it done. Right. Trying to memorize the lines. Right. Trying to So the uh, so she there was a doctor that came in and he was late for work or whatever. He was like the, the chauvinist doctor. <laughs> But and, it was a, yeah, and it she was, was a like, sixty-year-old gay man who, <laughs> yeah. who acted like he loved the pussy. I yeah. love pussy. She goes, "Where have you been? I'm gonna fuck you up. <laughs> I'll cut you, motherfucker." And he goes, well, "I was at the Rainbow Bar and Grill <laughs> <laughs> partying with girls." He goes, "Ooh, I love when you." What was the line? <laughs> oh, go ahead. When you wash my cunt and shave my pussy hair. <laughs> yeah, a typical thing. Yeah, she. Uh, <sighs> <laughs> and one of the we got one of the things that she used to do. I'd always ask her, and she she understood this. What? What was the exact line? I want to get what? It, yeah, what that's it, the line I was thinking. I want to get. I would say, "What's on your mind right now?" And she every time would say, "Without fail." I like to suck dick and get fucked up the ass. <laughs> yeah. and you can play off that because yeah. it was just such a shock. And she would that say this, it was such gusto, like, right? I and like she, to suck dick. I and like get to fucked, fucked up, up the ass. ass, and you're like, whoa! <laughs> because she was a she. Even though she says all that, she was a very she was a she was college professor. Quiet. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. 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 So, yeah. So it's just like, like I said, colorful characters. And you would break it too. We're like, we're like, as we were doing something like. Hey, um, big mama, you look like you got something on your mind. What's what's up with you right now? What are you thinking about? Right. And then she would like hit you with. Well, that. you see, the way I look at like the Ding Dong Show, it's like I have all these weapons. Yeah. And when I I 
because I do it so much, I learn when to pull that weapon out. Yeah. And that's what it really becomes. And what do you think other people, like other comics, think of you? Or uh, do you care? I or do an, care. And do you care, I guess. I do care, but it's like it's like uh, like at Dean Gelber's Roast, mm-hmm. who was the former general manager of the comedy store, yeah. who left and went to Hawaii to make bologna and pineapple sandwiches. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever he did. Yeah. Anyway, they had a roast. And one comic, her whole thing, you know, they had a roast. So I'm roasted a little bit. And her line was, well, Don, Don Barris runs a show of retards. And I finally figured out why. Because he's retarded. The biggest retard of them all. Biggest retard of them all. And you know what? And the truth is, I look at them, it's like yeah. I look at an agent. They have no vision of anything else. Yeah. See, my feeling is, well, wait a second. He's on a TV show. He works with somebody because, and it wasn't because like, hey, I became a good audience warm up. I met Jimmy Kimmel because he wanted to be, he wanted to in on my project. Yeah. So it's not like I had to kiss his ass to be part of his social crew. And I'd made a movie that won awards. You don't have the vision to see that I might be doing something right. Yeah. Are you that insane that you can't... Yeah, you can't imagine... Like, I tell people sometimes when they start to argue, I'm like, okay, stop first. Imagine if I wasn't wrong, now imagine this same situation. Right. And people are like, all right, well, oh, okay. And they can see some, how, the good in it sometimes. It, it's like the person that said that, I, I, I don't think that woman, and I'm, I won't say her name, has had one ounce of success in any way. But it's so easy to say, that guy's an idiot, that right. guy's an idiot. Exactly. So easy. And it, it's just, I just think that people are very blinded by a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Anything different. So does that bother you when people say those things? Uh, I think it bothers, but I have... It would probably bother a lot of people. The, it does, but here's the way I work it over at the comedy store. If somebody's cool with me, yeah, I go out of my way to be nice. You're a good guy. There's There's people there that are nice. But if somebody that I know isn't into me, I just have no time for them. Yeah, just stay out of the way. I just, like, I don't right. even, not even a hello. Oh. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just just stay the fuck away. So, but does it affect me? I think anytime anybody says anything, but I just try not to hear it. Yeah, you want to hear people say positive things, but right. The way I try to look at it sometimes is like, let's say you have like a ninety five percent approval rating, which is super high, right? Um, and then somebody's like, you, I, "You fucking suck. I don't like your stuff." And you're like, "Damn it, I gotta change." But you're like, "No, no, that's just one of the five. Right? That's they were already there. You already knew five out of a hundred didn't like you." So just because you actually came in contact with them, right? it's okay. They're one of the five. Oh, but I do remember when I first started doing comedy, I remember if someone wasn't laughing. Oh, yeah. It would drive crazy. Right? It would drive me crazy. And, mm-hmm. I, and I'd actually, well, what's the matter? Why Why don't you? And I was got to the point. Why don't you find me funny? Yeah. I've eventually become okay with that when I see like an older couple, conservative, and they're not laughing because I might be too dirty for them or right. something. And it, it got to a point where it's like, yeah, you shouldn't come see me. And right. I'm just part of a show with lots of other people, but I'm not the comic for you. Yeah. Just the way Dice wouldn't be the comic for you. Absolutely. Doesn't mean Dice wasn't a fucking humongous comic. Oh, it, it's just not right for everybody. You, when did you start doing comedy? Uh, 99. After Dice was. Yeah. Was see, I I got to like open shows when he was playing arenas Jesus. for him. Yeah. And it's just, it's just amazing what he became. Yeah. It's just so offensive. He, but he picked out something mm-hmm. that just clicked with a lot of people. He said he was always like, "You don't want everybody liking you. You want some people loving you and some people hating you." Right. And then everyone's talking. Right. You know what? And it was like it was funny when I got to open for him on the road. It was great because the greatest thing about Dice yeah. is now, you know, Dice is good at playing because he's he's a simple minded man yeah. that you can goof around with, mm-hmm. and he. Like the way that I got into his group, like where he likes everybody to listen to what he says. Yeah, I'm um, in charge. Everybody, what well, I was. Rush. He likes people to kiss his ass. Mm-hmm. But I was the guy. You're a I fucking idiot. And I called him dunce and things <laughs> like that. And he loved it. So I would get in arguments with him, and we would go. Like he'd take me when he would do a movie, yeah. and he'd give me a small part in the movie. But I. Re- I would remember we'd go to lunch where the cafeteria is filled with all these people and I'd start screaming, you fucking idiot. <laughs> Everybody would look and he'd, yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh-huh. And he, here's the star of the movie bowing down to this guy. 
And it just, but it was like so fun because you could do anything. And because it was dice, everybody let you do it in the real world too. Yeah. Yeah. I do remember one time getting in a fight with him in the back of a cab in Portland, Oregon. And the cabbie finally just said, get the fuck out of my cab. Everybody get the fuck out. I can't take it no more. Because <laughs> he was just too much? Yeah. Too much playing? Yeah. That's hilarious. All right. I think we're close to done. I'm yeah. trying to think if there's anything else I, I want to know from you about the Ding Dong Show in general. Well, Are there any things like you've had problems with at all or, or like had, had to... What do you mean by problems? I don't know. Some, some things you would have liked better from the Ding Dong Show or some... some things you, you, you i don't know i i think for. i i think that the main thing is this oh, i yes. wish i had an idea of how to promote it yeah because that's always I, the toughest thing for for people was like how do i get people to like what i do but then you see other people that that do these these bringer shows and it's like you look at how many people go to these things they pack a room yeah but that's not doesn't not like people come back for any of those things they're just there for their friend that's on the show you know one time I just, I just wish I could figure it out. Yeah. I, do you know anybody who has that kind of knowledge? And I'm not saying like turn them on to me, but do you know somebody that like, boy, they just have tons of people come to their stuff all the time. I mean, you got a guy like Dane Cook who started like that. You know, he got he got to an audience. He figured out how to find his audience and and tell them who he's in town. Here's what I realized. I I, I watched the Flaming Lips. I was always a fan of theirs, but I went to watch with Jeff Ross. We were in Canada. We saw a concert of theirs. And I fell in love. They're a great. Live yeah, band. I, I'll great. tell you. I never liked them until I saw them live. They played Kimmel. Yeah, a few times. As oh, you've got to tell me next time. The nicest people in the oh, world. Oh, totally. That the, guy Wayne is so fucking. His nice. His wife is just crazy nice. Wow. Crazy nice. I mean, like, oh, hell, I mean, I'm the audience warm up now in the realm of like Hierarchy. the band. Yeah, the, the band goes all over the world, and they meet tons of like people that are warming up the audience or something yeah. like that she remembered me remembered things i said came up and hugged me and kissed me i'm wow. like whoa and, and her husband's the lead singer of this band yeah but uh, but anyway just oh, the my, nicest people sorry my point was this that i'm a huge fan of them and i was like i'll definitely go see them anytime they come i i wasn't a fan when they were here last like i was like yeah i like them a little bit whatever but I was like definitely and then i realized three months went by and i haven't even looked at their website to see they might have played here last week or might be here next right. week it's just hard to actually reach those fans. Right. Because I would have definitely gone, and then I wouldn't have been aware if they came. I didn't miss it, luckily, but like, it's like, how do you get the people who would like it over there? And I have well, no idea what the then, answer is. Then let me ask this. Yeah. Somebody out there in your... How many people that listen to your podcast? Do you mind me asking that? Um, uh, it's usually like eighty to 100,000. Seriously? Something like that, yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how Holy much. shit. Yeah. Yeah, well, some of you 100,000 people out there, somebody, now that you're going to be my friend on Facebook and Twitter, it's Simply Down One and Facebook <laughs> Down Barris, yeah. uh, if you can help me in any way, boy, because I'll tell you, I have something here and I just wish people knew about it. You should it. see it live. You should see it live. I'm, it's like I, I want to talk about it because it's such a unique project that you're doing, a project, whatever show, whatever yeah. it is, but it's like. I'm not doing it full justice. Well, you know what? Here's what I heard, and the cool thing is this. Uh, some of the upper management over at the Comedy Store, yeah. Paulie has said that they're going to really kind of push this a little oh, bit. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, once it gets on, and then people can decide for themselves. Right. It's like getting a show on the air. Once it's on, like a yeah. TV show, then it's like now people can see it. Right. But if you could have the best pilot in the world, if NBC decides not to pick it up, then no one will see it. Well, I, I will say this, Ari, you are truly right. one of my best friends over at the Comedy Store, uh -huh. and I appreciate you letting me do this. I really do. No problem, man. And, yes, Mary Jane, you, you have something you want to say? Oh, hello, Mary Jane. Use the mic, of course. I believe you forgot to say it's www.simplydonthepodcastnetwork.com or thebigthreepodcast.com. Or the dingdongshow.com. So there you have it. You can find all those. <laughs> yeah. And on my website, I'll put up a bunch of stuff. I'll put links to all that stuff. Yeah, that's why I tried to make it a little more interactive hey, on, the, I, on the site. On your website, can yeah. I give you a picture of my penis? Um, yeah. Uh, 
Well, yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Right. That's, I just want to get it out there, too. I want that to be, become more popular. Yeah, but I'll probably have like a couple of videos or clips up there. That I'm sure it's up online that I can find, put up there so people can see it. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, and I, I, really, I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. your friendship. I appreciate everything about you. You're a good man. No problem. Sure. Have a good 2012, I guess, right? I don't have any resolutions. I would tell you if I have them, but I think January 1st is an arbitrary day. So when I make resolutions, I just change. I don't wait for January to do it. Usually when people like in December 15th, like, oh, I'm going to change in two weeks. Like That means you're going to forget and not do anything. Just change if you want to change. Just change today. If you want to quit drinking, don't wait till after New Year's. Just immediately change today. That was preachy, but whatever. All right. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. I will see you next week. Oh, oh, oh. And next week, I'm doing the episode um, where I interview an upscale prostitute. It's one of the most awesome interviews I've ever done. Seriously, check out next week. It's January 9th. You guys will absolutely love it. It was a humongous open conversation with an upscale prostitute, sort of a call girl, you know, the kind you get reservations with, not the kind you just find in the street. It's so fucking cool. It was a four and a half hour long conversation. Don't worry. I'm going to break it up. Um... I don't know how, maybe an hour, or an hour and a half. Maybe I'll split it up through the week. I don't know, but it, it's, it's, it's one of my favorites. So um, tune in next week for that. But thank you, everybody, and uh, goodbye. Happy 2012. Fuck Art Shafir. He didn't pay for none of this goddamn music. Cheap ass fucking Jew.